The Shadows of Paris written by Cyprian Jossen, Romance Audiobook Chapter 3, Talking It Over In the Igbo Union group meeting, Okia Kike shared his version of the story, portraying Ifeoma as ungrateful and deceitful. He claimed she left him for a wealthy French man, tarnishing her image, within the community. Some members accused him of colluding with a Cameroonian woman, suggesting he was being used as a pawn to sabotage Ifeoma's marriage, to a white man. This stirred up tensions, with accusations flying around the room. Some members expressed support for Guillaume La Chase, praising him as a kind police officer who has assisted many Africans without papers. He is white outside and black inside. He's our brother and in law, one member defended Guillaume against Okiakike's accusations. Welcome, everyone. Let's begin with Okiakike. Please share your side of the story, the president greeted. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Ifeoma betrayed me. I brought her to Paris, and she left me for a French man. How do we know this is the whole truth? Maybe there's more to the story, one member said. Okiakite, are you sure you're not just upset that Ifeoma chose someone else? Another member pointed out. The Igbo Union in Paris convened monthly gatherings for socializing and enjoying traditional meals prepared by their wives. The men, clinging to Nigerian cultural norms, exhibited a sense of authority within their families. It was a man's world dominated by male voices. Meanwhile, the women held their own opinions shaped by rumors, particularly those circulating about Ifeoma's association with a Cameroonian woman and her restaurant. According to the women, Ifeoma was perceived as a husband snatcher who drove away Guillaume La Chase's former wife, others used the word fiancé to sympathize with the white lady. Members of the Igbo community, especially those from the same village, gossiped about her for defying tradition by engaging in a mixed-race relationship with a white man. Interestingly, despite their disapproval of such unions, some of these women had daughters who had married white French men, causing a shift in their perspective toward interracial marriages. Ifeoma and her friend found amusement in the hypocritical attitudes of some Igbo union members toward French culture and their lifestyles in France. Many had resided in the country for over a decade without acquiring proficiency in French or even English due to their limited education. Some had even become estranged from their native Igbo language due to the challenges of life in Paris. Despite earning university degrees, some were content with menial jobs. Paris, with its diverse challenges, prompted African immigrants to adopt various survival strategies. Discussing Ifeoma's marriage to a white man seemed ironic, given the complexities of immigrant life in the city. The Igbo Union, which used to be a cultural gathering, had turned into a kind of cultural show and tell. Members would display photos of their lovely village houses where they stayed during annual or biennial visits, provided they could afford flight tickets. Unfortunately, some members had faced deceit from their own siblings. Despite sending money with the expectation of having a house built, they ended up with nothing. The trusted relatives had squandered the money, leading to a realization among the members that perhaps they didn't know how to manage their siblings well. The Sunday meetings turned into times of arguments among Igbo Union members. They debated Okiakike's complaints about Ifeoma marrying a white man while neglecting their own struggles in Paris. Despite the gossip, Ifeoma informed Guillaume that they would attend the year-end Igbo Christmas party. She expressed her weariness of exclusively living in a predominantly white world and desired to connect with Ndine Wayne, people from her own culture and country. In the vibrant atmosphere of the Igbo Christmas party, Chief Odegu Onuwan, the union president, took the stage. He entertained the crowd with jokes that recounted stories of the old Igbo immigrants who had made Paris their home for over 40 years. With a stand-up comedy act that amusingly blended Igbo, English, and French, he had the audience in stitches. The party was a celebration of Igbo culture in the heart of Paris, featuring lively music, traditional food, and the unique mannerisms of older Igbo immigrants evident in their language blend. Chief Odegu Onuwan, seated regally on the high table, exuded confidence, boasting of his greater achievements compared to others in the community. The atmosphere buzzed with the spraying of money, symbolizing prosperity and goodwill. As the revelry continued, there was an unexpected turn of events when, with Guillaume's permission, Okiakike danced with Ifeoma. Surprisingly, 
Ifeoma whispered to Okiakike, assuring him that they would meet and that he should keep it a secret. A few days later, Okiakike and Ifeoma discreetly met in a hotel room in Paris. She was already in the room, waiting for him. On the other hand, Guillaume was on a special mission, investigating a suspected drug cartel deal moving from Spain to France orchestrated by a notorious Congolese mafia group that had eluded the Spanish and French police several times. When he called Ifeoma, she lied, claiming she was at Maritere's place discussing the possibilities of opening an African restaurant in Paris. Meanwhile, the good news was that Mama Damour was on the verge of selling her restaurant because her clients had dwindled after Ifeoma left. We can buy it from her, and you can take over. The clients moved away because you left, Guillaume suggested. With what money, Guillaume? she asked. Okay, I will surprise you, my love. Do you want to be a boss or not? That's the big question, Guillaume teased. Yes, I want to take over Mama Damour's restaurant, Ifeoma responded. That's your revenge, ma chérie, Guillaume intoned. When Guillaume ended the call, Okiakaik knocked on the door. She opened it, and for the first time, they seemed like innocent lovers meeting for the first time in the village. Come in, my darling, she said, ushering him in. Beyond her control, she didn't realize that she had fallen deeply in love with two men, one from Nigeria and the other from France. But she wanted to know one thing from him. How did you manage to come to Paris, she asked him. Both of them were now sitting on the bed holding the hand of each other. One day, I received a message on my phone from a woman called Mama Damour. She told me she was your boss. That she would help me to meet you in Paris. And then what happened next, Ifeoma asked. We chatted on the phone for almost one month before she told me that you have got married to an old white man called Guillaume. I was devastated when I heard the news. So that which found a way to contact you? But you later fell in love with her, isn't it? Ifeoma queried. I did not fall in love. She forced herself on me. So sweet. She put the sweet in your mouth, and you licked it. How do you want me to believe you, Okiakike? Even a child will not believe that trash you want me to swallow. Ifeoma, is that why you invited me here? Why are you jealous? Are you not a married woman, after all? Heem, poor man, you didn't even make any effort to hold me back. You see another man, steal your woman, and you are clapping for him to take her. Oak, so you can't protect me? Okay, Ife, let's not quarrel about the hands of destiny. Let's talk about how to come out of this mess. Both of us are lost in Paris. I can't even understand myself anymore. It was the first time he called her Ife, that familiar nickname he used to call her in their intimate moments just to let her know he was madly in love with her. He wiped the tears off her eyes, and held her very close to him. Then he continued, I will protect you, but for now we are in a fix. Let's face realities. We are in a crossfire between Mama Damour who brought me to France and Guillaume, who is now your official husband, I don't know how you can do this to me. I will fix it. Promise me that you will not say a word to your friends in the Igbo Union. Their motive is to eat, drink, and gossip, she said. Ife, what's on your mind? Okiakek asked. I will talk to Guillaume about us, she replied. Ife, that's a crazy idea. You can't do that, he cautioned her. Crazy ideas are the ones that work best, she said. After Okiakek left, Ifeoma couldn't believe she was with him. The sound of his footsteps leaving rang like a warning bell in her mind reminding her of the blood oath they took, vowing to stay together. As the room got quiet, she looked around, regretting that she yelled at him instead of creating a moment of intimacy. She missed him. The door, like a symbol, showed the exit of Okiakike, a guy from her past who poured his love on her. Two men tormented her soul. In her daydreams and talking to herself, her thoughts got all jumbled up. Here I am, on the edge of saying something that could break the careful balance I've tried hard to keep. My heart is racing with both worry and excitement. Guillaume, my husband, has been my support in France. Just thinking about risking our relationship makes me feel really scared. But Okiakaik is still in my heart, like a memory from the past that I thought I had left behind. The weight of my secret feels heavy, 
and I'm wrestling with whether what I'm doing is right, how did I end up in this mix of feelings? Guillaume deserves to know the truth, and I need to find the courage to share what's really going on in my heart. Thoughts of Okia Kike linger, reminding me of a love that used to be strong. Guillaume, my love, I hope you can understand all the mixed-up feelings that have been going on in my mind, but I cherish our relationship. Because in this moment of honesty, I'm starting something that might change what love and marriage mean. How did the idea of loving two men pop into my head? When she entered the bathroom and looked in the mirror, what she saw was not her face, it resembled the head of a pig stretching its neck as if it wanted to crash through the mirror and jump on her face. She shouted, but nobody heard her voice. In Paris, if anything happens to you, the neighbors might not know or come to your rescue. In her case, though, she must be suffering from hallucination, a type of mental illness. I Fioma, what is happening to you? she asked herself. When she was just nine years old, something strange happened to her that stayed with her throughout her childhood. One day, she went to her mother with a spooky story, she had seen a ghost, a mysterious figure that seemed to have bad intentions of taking her away to a mysterious land of spirits. In response, her mother called her Aquan J, which means a child who has been through multiple deaths and rebirths, returning to bring trouble and distress to her parents. Her mother, trying to make sense of the eerie encounter, offered a unique explanation. That woman you saw was you in your last life, she explained. According to her mother, after each rebirth into the present world, the apparition of her past self continued to deceive her. The purpose, her mother claimed, was to lead her to an early death, thus continuing a cycle of torment for her parents. The belief in being haunted by one's previous self is deeply rooted in Igbo society and follows Ifeoma to Paris. This idea of reincarnation and the potential harm caused by a spectral version of one's past life not only influenced her outlook on life, but is also a shared philosophy among many Africans living in Paris. In this foreign land, Ifeoma, like numerous other African expatriates, struggled with these supernatural beliefs, fearing a connection with ancestral spirits and the reincarnation of a child returning to this world many times. Superstition played a significant role in their lives in France, 